Morning, Glory America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. Greetings to my 400 affiliates across the United States and North America. I'm joined now in the Hugh Hewitt Show by Austin Goolsby. He is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He's also the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. You Cubs fan, we're sorry about that. But uh, Austin, welcome back. Good to have you, friend. Yeah, you. Thanks for having me. I would like to know your opinion on what the United States should do in phase four, five, and six to reopen the economy. Well, A, I'm confused by the phases. It just feels like the second round. You know, we had we had the the first big $2 trillion round of, of relief. I'm of the view, and there are a lot of economists that – that agree with me or I agree with them that the number one rule of virus economics is that the best way to restore the economy is to contain this rate of spread of the virus. I think that conventional stimulus doesn't work when people are afraid that the virus is not under control, which is not to say, a, you know, a vaccine or a, or a treatment, just you, we, we have to slow the rate of spread of that virus because if we're in lockdown, and when we're in lockdown, the economy can't grow. Now, multiple countries have shown us how to prevent the economy from totally imploding. That is, if you look at Taiwan, if you look at Korea, now if you look at New Zealand, they're doing enough testing and enough tracing that the only people that go into isolation are the people who have the disease. And so they're not in lockdown, and their economies are not are not in freefall. But I I think the that's what I would do is start throwing everything we have at wartime mobilization effort on stopping the spread of the disease, and simultaneously keep extending relief, administer it a little better, um, so that people can keep food on the table and not get thrown out of their houses while we wait to get that under containment. Now, yesterday, Andrew Cuomo uh, had a little bit of news that was missed by people, that the New York Department of Health has developed an antibody test. That echoed a similar release from the Mayo Clinic and a third uh, potential antibody test from Research Triangle in North Carolina. Antibody testing with 99.9 to 7 degree certainty means you won't get it again. How important is it to scale that test to find out who is safe to send back into the workforce and into the public? Yeah, that seems like it would be qu- quite important. You know, the, the in a weird statistical way, w- the accuracy of that test becomes critically important, which is to say if you get false positives at some reasonable rate, what's normally reasonable rate, let's say 10% false positives, then unfortunately you would still have the problem that a bunch of people think they're immune, but they're not, and they go out and they get sick. But if that test has a very high degree of accuracy, like you're describing, that could be critical because those are the, you know, in, in a way, if you already had it and you recover, you're kind of a superhero. And so you could be doing deliveries, and you can be working at frontline responders, or you could be doing anything and go back to work. I'd say category two of when we could go back to work is if we did random testing, so you had an idea in different places of what's the baseline level of infection. Anywhere where the baseline level of infection is low enough that People are not afraid that if they go out of their house, they're going to get it from somebody who doesn't know that they have it. If the baseline level is low enough, then that kind of green zone idea is perfectly viable. But the the impetus, the thought, the something that says, wow, this is so bad for the economy, let's just go take off the stay-at-home orders – a, I'm not sure that it will work because I think a lot of people were starting to stay home before they even put the orders in place because they were afraid. And B, it threatens to move us back to square zero where we have to go into lockdown again. Yeah. And the lockdown is the thing that's killing us. 
Let me talk to you about the two ideas I've seen in circulation that I approve of. One is pandemic bonds. I know the president is considering it. Mnuchin is considering it over at Treasury, uh, where the American people would be asked to help pay for relief in the way that they did in World War II and World War I uh, at a very, maybe a negative rate of interest because interest rates are so low. And then secondly, a lot of Americans are going to have to reach for their retirement funds whether they want to or not. Now, the first bill... Uh, took the 10% penalty off, and that's good. Uh, the first bill also said no mandatory distribution at 70 and a half for a year. That's good. But I think if you have to go get your retirement right now, because there is no option, Austin, that we ought to have a flat tax that's much lower than the normal rate of return because this is an unprecedented circumstance. What do you make about bonds, and what do you make about, say, a 10% flat tax on retirement income withdrawals? Well, uh, let's start with the bonds. I, I favor the bonds. I think that's a I think that's a good idea. It's important to recognize what you're trying to do there. Money in the in the language of the economist, money's fungible. So you're not doing anything by issuing a Corona bond that you use only for Corona. That that all that does is. That's government debt of just like any other form. What I like about the idea of corona bonds is to make clear, as we did with war bonds, that this isn't a thing that should be revenue neutral. We should not be trying to find a way to pay for relief for what's a temporary one-time shock that was totally unexpected and is critically important. And so I think it is important for us to to identify that, and I think the bonds, if the, a if they brought people together, that pe- that people could see, look, I'm the I'm we're adding to the national debt, but it's for a specific purpose, and we have no problem doing that. I think that'd be great. Now, the, the weird irony, as you say, is interest rates are so low that offering the government zero interest rates is not even doing them a favor anymore. That's correct. Because the interest rates, you know, are are teetering on negative. On your flat tax idea, I got to tell you, I don't agree. I think one of the problems that, that, that I had with some sections of the CARES Act, the $2 trillion relief bill, I thought were great. Some I had some problems with. And most of the ones I had problems with are where they're steering the relief and the money to the wrong people, to the people who are not at risk of not being able to put food on the table, not at risk of being evicted from their homes and, and stuff like that. What the, that's where we've got to make sure, in a way, if we could have forbearance and become Rip Van Winkle and go to sleep and wake up when this thing is done, in a way, that'd be the that'd be a good answer. Your 10% flat tax is by far the largest tax cut for people who are in the highest tax bracket. It and is, but Austin, let me... have a large amount of assets in savings, and if you have a large amount of assets in savings, if we have a fixed amount of money, I'm not wanting the money to get directed to people who are making $100,000-plus a year. But, Austin, my argument is I'm thinking of restaurant owners specifically, and I do not own a restaurant, nor will yeah. I ever own a restaurant. 3% have closed permanently, more than double digits threatened to do so. If those people have, and many of them have, retirement accounts, if they need to make their lease payment, they're yes. going to go get that money. They're going to not give up their dream. Should we tax them at an ordinary amount when they, they've been prudent? Should we punish them right now when we ought to let them – Forbearance is better, but forbearance is not going to be available for everyone. I'm just trying to figure out how to keep these businesses alive so they can keep people yeah, employed. No, I know you are. Oh, the only thing that I'm cautioning you is there are a whole that, – that's not – if you want to save the restaurant owners and other small businesses, I think the best way to do that is through a direct small business relief-type fund rather than – go to, uh, just a guess, 95-plus percent of the owners of big retirement accounts are not restaurant owners. So you're giving a big tax cut to a whole bunch of people. Oh, they're air conditioning unit people. They're they're all over. 
they're all over the economy, but there's $12 trillion in assets there. And it's mostly because people have been successful in business that they don't want to close up. I'm thinking of an electrical contractor I know in L.A. who I just, I just he, he employs so many people. Give it some thought, Austin. Keep coming back. Austin Goolsby is one of those Democrats who ought to be on any national commission that talks about reopening the economy. There are good economists out there from the wrong side of the political aisle, but very good economists. Austin, thank you for joining me. I'll be right back, America. 